you got your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 15. Today I'm going to do something a little bit different. Maybe not too different, but I want to read a short passage of Scripture here in Acts 15 as we finish up this chapter. And also I uh, want to read from the book of Luke. And so... Let me just read these passages first, and then uh, I just want to talk to you this morning, church. Can I just talk to you this morning? All right? Let me read this. In Acts chapter 15, starting in verse 36, it says, Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now turn back with me, flip to your left, if you have a paper Bible, into Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Luke 5, starting in verse 1. When you have it there, say amen. 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 All right. I still hear some pages turning. Right, Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 1. So it was as the multitude pressed about him, him being Jesus, as the multitude pressed about Jesus to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Genesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he'd stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. This is God's word. May the Lord God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for the scriptures that give us comfort, that show us reality. Lord, you show us what we really are through scriptures, and you show us our struggles and our sins. Your perfect law converts the soul that we might think according to your ways instead of ours. I pray, Lord, that we would be changed today by your word, and I pray, Lord, that you give me the words to speak. I have no good teachings of my own. I have no wise words of my own creation. I need your word. And I need the wisdom that your spirit brings. Thank you for giving it. Thank you for leading us, Lord. Help me to minister strength and encouragement to your people. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now in Acts chapter 15, we've gotten to a point in our story that Luke is relating to us of how Paul and some of his brothers get divided. Now I titled my sermon this morning, and I don't 
think it's necessary that I should title the sermon, but I always pick one because it kind of runs with the theme that I've been thinking with. But a lot of times I don't actually preach what the title of my sermon is. And this morning I might not do that again. Anybody ever notice that? Well, I have titles of sermons and that's not even what my point is. It's all right. It's the starting point. I was thinking about people being determined despite their division in church. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a lot of division in the world today, and that division has crept into the church. And that's not a news thing. There's been division in the church for thousands of years. In the first century, there was division in the church. The scriptures tell us in Acts chapter 15 that there was a contention so sharp that Paul didn't want John Mark to go minister with him. There's nothing said here of Paul saying, well, John, ain't, John Mark's not saved. He doesn't accuse him of not being a brother. He just says he departed from us, and he didn't go with us to the work before. I'm not taking him now. Studying this passage and thinking about the struggles that we go through as a people and wanting unity and harmony in our church and something I've been praying for, that we would band together and draw closer together as a family, that one of those obstacles is division, dissension, lies and envy, sometimes hard work and laziness. Those things butting head causes people to divide. Disagreements over doctrine. And the thought that, that I couldn't escape as I studied the scriptures is you can't take everyone. You can't take everyone everywhere you go. <sighs> My father-in-law likes to joke. And when we're out in public, I like to get his goat, especially when we're in public. I like to mess with him. And we play around and we, you know how guys do. We insult each other for fun. I only, I only talk to you like this because I love you. Kind of, you know what I'm talking about. Kind of that locker room talk. And my father-in-law has a phrase that he uses a lot, especially when I do things to embarrass him in public. He'll say, I can't take you anywhere. Can't take you anywhere. You can't take everybody everywhere. Have you ever tried to go shopping with someone and they don't want to go to the stores that you want to go to? Have you ever Have you ever had a playmate? Uh, see, I had a young lady come and visit our house this weekend to have a play date with my daughter and I listened to them a little bit of how they were kind of talking about what they were going to do no I want to do this let's do this well let's do this first then we'll do that and I listened to how they kind of went back and forth and they came to agreements and figured out what they were going to do together but there were a couple times it was like no I want to do this I want to do that happens all the time where we get divided. And it, it doesn't have to be this sharp contention where we disagree and we hate each other and then we're fighting. It doesn't have to be that. But division happens naturally all the time. We have differences of opinion, right? There are some things that are truth. And it doesn't matter what your opinion is about it, it's the truth. And you don't get to change the truth. But there are some things that is just a matter of opinion. And there's no truth about it. If you like red and I like blue, there's no truth in that that I have to be right, even though I am. But I don't have to be right because I like blue. That's a matter of opinion. It's taste. It's preference. There are some things, some things that we're divided about that it doesn't matter that we divide about it. Because it's not the big issue. It's not the main thing. 
You know, I hear people say, you know, to keep the main thing the main thing. I've found that most of the division that happens in fellowships and in churches are not about the main thing. They're about some secondary thing, some other thing that someone has made more important than fellowship and forgiveness. Ooh. Ouch. Yes, ouch. <sighs> it's going to be a hard one this morning. You can't take everyone everywhere you go. Because not everyone's in agreement with you. You know what? The scriptures tell us that God called Abraham to go from the place that he was at, to go from his father's house to a land that he would show him, and he brought Lot with him. And we find that a lot of the promises that God told Abraham he would fulfill didn't get fulfilled until he left Lot behind. Gideon. What a powerful story. Yet some of y'all, are, you're more familiar with the 300 at Sparta than you are with the 300 with Gideon. And I find that fascinating in the church. When you mention the 300 mighty warriors, most people in the American, most men at least, I've found that I've talked to in this area, I can't speak worldwide, but that I've spoken to when I mention 300 warriors, they think of Leonidas. They think of Sparta. This is Sparta. And he kicks the guy, you know what I'm talking about? You know that there's a much older story where God whittled down an army with a man named Gideon and overcame another army that didn't actually have to fight. They just smashed a bunch of pots and started praising God and blowing trumpets, and the enemy killed themselves. They even had dreams of a big barley loaf, a big loaf of bread rolling down the hill and smashing their tents. Why don't Hollywood make a movie about that? That Gideon was given a choice of who to bring, and God told him the criteria of the men he should choose. Thousands of guys, and they go down to the river, and he tells Gideon, for those men who get down into the water and are drinking the water straight from the stream, and their faces are down in the water, he says, send those men home. But the ones that take it up in their hands and they lap it like a dog, he said, keep those guys. He said, keep the dogs with you. Keep the, keep the mongrel guys with you that aren't so concerned about meeting their own needs. They're looking to make sure the enemy doesn't take them by surprise. All the men who are selfish trying to fulfill and fill their own gut and they're not caring about the things around them, you need to get rid of those guys. Those ones that would take the water in their hands and lap it like a dog with their eyes up, those are the ones you want with you. You can't take everyone. There are some people that are just not going to agree with you. You don't have to hate them. Nowhere does God tell Gideon to hate those other men. Nowhere does the scripture say that Paul hated John Mark. He just can't go with you. We need to find, church, people in our own lives who will agree with us and go with us. And those people that don't want to come into unity with us, that don't want to work with us, we got to let them go. You ain't got to be mad. You ain't got to hate them, but not everybody gets to go with you. That's why I think it's best that we only have one wife. Listen, this is going to sound bad, but I'm going to say it anyway because some of you are thinking it. It's hard enough with one woman. That ain't nothing against you women because you can go the same way. It's hard enough with one man. Amen, sisters? Trying to take care of one adult boy. It's hard enough. You ever been trying to work with somebody you don't know? Oops. In the church, it used to be in the people of God, in the law, when you got married, the tradition was you're supposed to go away for a year to get to know one another. It's hard enough trying to fight battles in life. But it's really hard when you're trying to fight with someone you don't know. 
David said, I can't use these weapons, Saul. I can't use this sword. I can't use this shield. I haven't been tried with them. I would rather go fight a giant with a rag and a rock that I know I can use than some sword and shield that I've never practiced with. Mm. God said it's not good for man to be alone. But that doesn't mean you can take everybody. You see, Adam named all the animals. Scripture said a suitable help meet, a suitable helper was not found for him. Didn't mean that the animals were bad. He put Adam in a deep sleep and he opened his side and pulled out a rib. And the scripture said that God fashioned the woman. No, God didn't speak, let there be woman. See, he did that with the light. He said, let the earth bring forth. But when it talks about the woman that he made for the man, it said that he fashioned the woman and brought her to the man. Handmade. Molded. Mm -mm -mm. Can we be real? Man, when was the last time you looked at your wife and you said, Lord, thank you for Fashioning my woman. Thank you for putting your hands and putting all. Never mind, I'm going to go, go that way. All right? Can we be real? Let me tell you that God has some people hand picked for you. That doesn't mean that everybody has to be married. There's something that happened in the church, I don't know what it was, where a pressure has been put on young people that all people are supposed to get married. You know, not all people have to be married. But I tell you what, all people need partners. All people need a community of someone that they're joined to to do the work of the Lord. The scriptures give no, no approval of lone rangers in the church. You know that? That through faith in Christ, we are brought together in community. That's one of the reasons for church. It's one of the reasons for marriage. can't take everyone you can't take everyone not everyone's ready to go with you you're gonna have to make some hard choices you're gonna have to make some hard choices we see there in verse 40 in Acts 15 Paul chose Silas doesn't say why but he chose Silas now we can glean from the scriptures that Silas didn't do what John Mark did that when it was time to work Silas would work Unlike John Mark, who when they went to go do the work, he departed from them and would not work. Paul chose Silas. Paul chose Silas. Could you imagine? Could you imagine how Silas felt? Knowing that Paul had rejected one man and said, you can't come with us when we go to Cilicia. You can't come with us. Silas, come on, let's go. Pack your bags. Can you imagine what Silas was feeling? I imagine part of him was feeling bad for John Mark. Part of him was thinking, man, I, I, I like John Mark, but you chose me. Did he ever ask why? I bet he asked why. One of the things, now we don't know all the things, but I know for sure one of the reasons that Paul chose Silas is because Paul had standards. Paul had standards. And John Mark had failed to meet some of those standards, so therefore John Mark couldn't go. Silas could. God forbid that in the church, when men of God and women of God begin to lower their standards just so they can include everybody. Ooh, that's a tough one. I hope you got your shoes on and your steel toes on, because I might step on some feet today. I'm talking to myself, so don't take offense or don't take this personal, but if something hits you straight between the eyes or in your heart... Take it as a rebuke. Take it as correction. We need to fix some things. Listen, you young ladies, especially you young ladies, and I've been accused of being sexist, but I'll read the scriptures. He made them male and female. God's the one that made the difference, not me. Young ladies, please hear me. Do not ever lower your standards. Because some guy is a smooth talker, or he's cute, or he got a good job, or blah, blah, blah. Don't you ever lower your standards just so you can be with somebody. 
I've known way too many people in my life. They have lowered their standards and how God sees them and have lowered their standards about themselves just because they're lonely. It's, hey, listen, you better off being alone with the standard of Christ than to lower your standards to the world and to sin just so you can have somebody. It's better to be alone. It's better to be alone. Don't lower your standards. That's something that the, that the world doesn't want to hear. A church, we hold a high standard. The standard is that of Jesus Christ. And some would make excuse and say, well, we all fall short of it. Yes, that's true. But that is not an excuse to, to not try. At least try. Strive for righteousness. Obey his word. It's the wise man that obeys his word. You've got to make some hard choices. And it's going to be based on how high is your standard? How high is your standard? Listen, I want to look. I kind of was feeling that I wanted to go off and leave with a positive note, a positive example. In Luke chapter 5, what a better example than we can find than Jesus picking his partners, picking his team. Think about it. The scriptures show Jesus. It shows his ministry of how he taught, how he healed people. But in three of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it talks about Jesus picking his team and what he did and the kinds of men they were that he picked. And I found it fascinating in Luke, Luke chapter 5, the men that he picked, the scriptures say twice that they were partners. It says that when they cast their net into the water at the Lord's word, it says they signaled their partners in verse 7 in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so they began to sink. That, I don't know how many of you know this, it's Simon Peter, his brother Andrew, they were partners with James and John in this fishing business. These guys were partners in this. And I love how the scripture puts in details. Luke was a, he was a physician. He was precise with the words he uses. He says, the, the partner's in the other boat. So you don't want to be unequally yoked with people. You don't want to be the one doing all the work, doing all the footwork, doing all the hard work in a partnership. You've got to find a balance. The scripture says, James and John had their own boat. They came with gifts and resources into this partnership with something to give, something to help. They didn't come just relying on Simon's boat. They had their own boat. Who are you partnering with in this life? Who are the close friends that you have? Now, some of you, like I said, married. Your first partner is your spouse if you're married. You guys got to see eye to eye. You both have stuff you can bring to the table. Both of you have a boat, so to speak. Are you using what you have to build your relationship? For those of you not married, you have maybe a friend, a best friend, a brother, sister, high school friend, someone, a church friend, whoever that you're partnering with, someone that you pray with, someone that you call up to see how they're doing. You like to go get coffee together. You like to go get a burger together and you're hanging out. You're besties, right? Any kind of relationship that doesn't have reciprocity will eventually die. If it's not reciprocal, if there's not a give and a take, Men, your first ministry is your wives. You married men. I'm going to say this with as much gentleness and mercy as I can, I can muster. If your marriage is falling apart, men, it is your fault. That sounds like a big responsibility, doesn't it? The scriptures make it clear. They make it very clear that men are to come up under the headship of Christ and take responsibility for building their homes, starting with their marriage. Listen to your wife. 
Listen to your wife. Listen long enough to understand what she's really saying to you. Ooh, I have a tough one with that, honey, don't I? I'm preaching to myself. The scriptures say, the scriptures say that the woman, the woman's glory comes from her husband. Have you ever met have you ever met a woman that seems scorned, a woman that's unhappy, a woman that's depressed, doesn't have a glory about her? Oftentimes it's from neglect from someone that said they loved her. Now I'm not trying to generalize everything, but there's a truth in that. You daughters deserve better. You daughters of the king, you deserve better from us men. You deserve better. We as men of God, we got to do better. We got to listen. The scriptures say, men, dwell with your wives with understanding. Not a heavy hand. With understanding. It's the idea of a servant who carries. First of all, if you're going to carry, you have to know what you're supposed to carry. You have to know what it is that you're carrying. If someone said, hey, go in the house and uh, get the, the thing, the whatchamacallit, the be specific, right? That's what you would say. Be specific. Get the what. That's what it means to dwell with understanding with your wives. Is to understand and know what it is you're carrying. Do you know how valuable she is? I'm not talking about how much money you spend. Do you know how how much she's worth? She's worth the blood of Jesus Christ, the one you call Savior and Lord. He shed his blood for that woman of yours. Men of God, we need to stand up. Be husbands. Be fathers. That's what this community needs. That's what this church needs. Is men who will be men in the household according to God's word. Talking to myself. Do you know who you're partnered with? Your first ministry is to your spouse. I think about Peter and James and John sitting there. And they were getting ready for something. They toiled all night, the scripture says. And the scripture says that they were sitting there washing their nets, right? They've been toiling all night. It's daytime now, and they're washing their nets. Mark and Matthew say they were mending their nets. You know when fishermen, the kind of fishermen these men were, they have these nets that they have to fold up just right, and they have to be tied in such a way that when they they cast out the net, it has weights on the end, and it goes out flat, and it hits the water, and it goes down, and those weights... They go around the fish, and then when they pull the lines, it has to be tied in a specific way so that way it closes up the net around the fish. Well, what happens is when they're out catching fish and they're doing the work, sometimes the nets get worn. The fish bite the nets. Scales and fins cut the nets. The scriptures said that they were mending their nets. Sometimes they drag it against rock. Sometimes when they're pulling up a hull, it drags against the hull of the ship, so the nets get torn. And the scripture says that they'd been toiling all night, but instead of fishing, when they weren't fishing, when they weren't getting a catch, when they weren't bringing in a hull, when, when, when they weren't receiving the fruit of their labor, they were getting ready to fish again. They were mending their nets. And I read that, and I can't, I can't shake it. I think about that, and it's like, are you getting ready for what God's about to do? Or are you just waiting around, hoping something happens? The scriptures say that we should be ready in season and out of season. That God's going to bring a harvest. That God's going to do a work. That God's going to fulfill his promises. People of God, are you mending your nets? Are you getting ready? Your downtime is your prep time. 
I'm going to tell you right now, there are some answers to prayer that God is going to give you. You've been waiting for years. Anybody have this happen to them? You've been waiting for years. You pray for two or three years for something, but when God begins to answer, it happens overnight. One thing after another just starts to drop into place. Sometimes when God answers a prayer, you ain't ready for it. Go back and read the scriptures. If you read the original Greek, Jesus said, let down your nets, plural. Scriptures say, Peter threw out a net. He didn't throw out enough to catch the haul that the Lord gave him. He wasn't ready when the Lord did a miracle. The scriptures say he had to call for help, his partners. Hey, come on. Here, our net's not big enough. Listen, if the Lord gives you a word about what the Lord's going to do, it's going to be much bigger than you think. I'm telling you, the work the Lord is doing in your life is much bigger than you think it is. Don't be mad at me if you ain't ready. Don't be mad at somebody else if you ain't ready. Let me tell you what. My God thinks much bigger than you do. He thinks much bigger than I do. Some of us, we think, oh, this person, they're getting saved. I've been working for three, four years with this person, and they got baptized. Hallelujah, God brought in the harvest. You know what? It's bigger than that. Do you know that one person that got saved? How many people are they going to touch? How many people is going to be touched by that one person that got baptized? I'm telling you, the drought, the, the, the drought of fish, that, that catch that God is trying to make, it's much bigger Lord saved you, right? Some of you saved you as a young man. Your wife is a believer. Your kids are believers. You think that he was just saving you when you got baptized? He wanted your son to have a godly father. He wanted your wife to have a godly husband. You getting saved is not about you. God's plan is much bigger. Let me tell you something the scriptures say. This is the Old Testament. Malachi says, listen, if you will partner with me in the tithes and the offerings, this is the Richard paraphrase, if you take what you have, what I've given you, and you give it back to God, he says, I will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you will not be able to contain. And these brothers... We're sitting here, partners. It says that they brought up the fish and both their boats began to sink. You can't fake that. When the Lord moves, when the Lord does a work, it's much bigger than you think. He thinks eternally. He told Abraham, I swear I'm going to bless you. You know why God, you know why one of the reasons the scriptures talk about why God loved Abraham is because of his answer? Remember what Abraham answered? He says, but I have no seed. Some stranger in my house will be blessed. If you bless me, who am I supposed to pass it on to? That Abraham wasn't sitting there thinking, oh, the Lord's going to bless me. The Lord's going to bless me, 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 me. He wasn't, he didn't have that selfish attitude. He says, I have no seed. He says, Lord, I need someone to pass it on to. Now, this isn't no indictment. This isn't saying that you have to have kids. But I'm telling you, there are some of you that maybe don't have kids. Maybe you're not married, but you have spiritual children you can be feeding. That God's not blessing you so you can sit around and be blessed. You ever, you ever hear that kind of preaching where it's like, well, God's just going to bless us. We're going to sit around and be blessed. What? God blesses you so you can be a blessing. God blesses you. He pours into your life so you can pour into the lives of others. He told Peter, go out into the deep and cast out your nets. He told Peter to do that. And when the Lord's miracle showed up, he had to call people, other people into it. Other people who were ready. Other people who were ready. They were ready for something to happen. Are you ready for something to happen? Are you, here's a question. 
the kind of prayers you're praying, because some of y'all I know are praying big prayers, are you even ready for the answer that you really want? Some of us think we're ready, but we ain't done all our homework and footwork yet. Some of us got tattered nets that we ain't been working on, just waiting for God to do something. And when God's blessing comes, it's just going to tear your nets because you ain't ready. Mm. One of the worst things in the world to see is wasted potential. Wasted potential. Wasted potential happens when people get lazy. Wasted potential happens when we don't hone our skills and work on ourselves to better ourselves so we can be ready for the harvest that's coming. John, can I ask you this? I want to put you on the spot. Do you, do you sow seeds only in the years when you know it's going to be good? Every year. You, every year. Every year. Stock market goes down, sowing seeds, right? Stock market goes up. I'm sowing seeds, right? Something we can learn from the American farmer. Listen, you can't predict the blessing or the famine that's about to come. There have been few men who have been given that vision in Scripture. The Scriptures bear out that you might as well be ready and sow some seed when the season comes, whether or not it's going to be good. You sow anyway. You got to work anyway. You got to do the, listen, some of you have partnered together. There used to be a time when partnerships and marriages, we used to see people would come into the pastor's office and they would say things like, you know, I can't handle him. He's abusive. And he would have to minister to some real trauma. He's abusive. And, and he doesn't take care of me. He's not going to work. Those kinds of things. You know what pastors are getting nowadays of people coming into their offices when it comes to marriages? I'm not happy. Who told you you were going to be happy? <laughs> Who told you that? Marriage is hard. Partnerships and working with people is hard, but it's worth it. It's hard, but it's worth it. Who do you know that is happy all the time besides crazy people? Honestly, we, we've come up in a society that thinks they have to be happy all the time. Sometimes you just got to dig in and be committed because it's the right thing to do. And you come home whether you're happy or not. You come home whether things are good or not. You take care of your family whether you want to or not because you made a commitment. That's why they said for better or for worse in sickness and in health. The preacher was trying to tell you before you got married that one of y'all was going to go off the... Mm, never mind. <laughs> but I'm telling you, we've been warned. Partnership is hard. It's hard. Working together with people is hard. Even the mighty super apostle Paul. I love Paul. I love Paul. He's one of my favorite apostles. I love his writing. I love that there were miracles done by his hands. And I love how he stood up to people who were turning others away from the faith. He stood up to a witch and a warlock. And he was bold. But that brother couldn't get along with everybody. He had to tell John Mark, no. This boat is going to Cilicia. You're going to Cyprus. You can't come with me because I can't trust you. You got to be careful who you pick as a partner. You got to be careful who you pick as your team. Jesus, the scripture says, the scripture says that the night before he picked his apostles, the scriptures say this, that he spent all night in prayer. All night in prayer. That it was communion with the Lord, communion with his Father, that gave him the wisdom and the strength and led him to the disciples that he was to choose. And here's the thing. Jesus even says, have I not picked you 12 and one of you is a devil? Scriptures say, Jesus said, I picked you 12 and one of you is a devil. 
That tells me Jesus knew his team. He even knew which one was a devil. Because the Lord knows the heart. For us, that's where we got to seek the Lord. We got to be determined. Even if there's division, even if there's people we don't get along with, you got to be determined. At a minimum, to be partnered with the Lord, to be joined to him, to let him lead you to the kinds of people you should be with, to work with, to minister with. You can't take everybody. You're going to have to make some hard choices. One of the things that I think youth pastors are failing to tell their students is that not everybody in the youth group is your best friend. Not everybody on your swim team is your best friend. Not everybody in your college algebra is your best friend. That's a, that's a sad, hard re reality. And you can love everyone. You can be friendly and love everyone. But not everybody can be your best friend. Being a friend costs something. I'm talking about a real friend. I'm not talking about a Facebook friend where it's like, I kind of know you. I know what you look like. Hey, that's him. I'll click on him. That's not what I'm talking about. Real friendship costs something. It costs time. Sometimes it costs money. It costs sacrifice. You got to be willing to pour out forgiveness if you want a real friend. Because let me tell you what, your real friends will fail you. Right? Your best friends will fail you. But thank God he never fails. Amen. Thank the Lord that the Lord never fails. So you can trust him. Church, going into 2020, you know, we're already almost a month in. And some of y'all have already been dealing with some hard choices. Some of y'all have been dealing with some hard situations that you dragged in from last year. I mean, some of y'all are dealing with situations you dragged in from 2005. Here it's 2020, and you're still dealing with that same old mess. Church, sometimes we've got to look around at our team Anyone here have friends that their parents hated? You know, because good parents, good parents recognize that you'll be just like your friends. He who keeps company with fools shall himself become a fool. I don't mean you can't love everybody, but not everybody can go with you where you're going. Not everybody can minister with you in what God's doing. We got to be determined to follow the Lord despite all the division. We got to be determined in our own minds to do what's right. To do what's right. And I apologize to anyone in this church who is listening online. And if I've ever said anything or if I've misspoken to drive you away or to upset you, it was never my intentions. Sometimes I find that I'll say things that I know what I mean, but I don't fully explain it, so I'll be misunderstood. We all do that. And I realize that because of the position that I'm in, it's more important that I be mindful of that, that I speak clearly. And so if I haven't been clear and if I've offended you, come talk to me. Just come talk to me. I'm open to working things out with people. That's one of the things we have to realize about division is that it doesn't have to be permanent. It doesn't have to be hateful. It doesn't have to turn into backbiting and gossip and talking about one another. If we disagree, if we have trouble, let's settle it. That's something I've seen Paul do with John Mark. He wasn't, he wasn't talking behind his back. He let the brothers know, he's not coming with me. John Mark knew. And they dealt with it like men, and they went their separate ways. I love men who have a backbone come to talk to me about stuff. When I first got to this church, me and Jake Clover have had so many conversations. 
trying to work out our differences. And I know that brother prays for me. I know he does. I've heard him do it. I've seen him do it. And I've felt the answers. You see, that's why I'm not afraid to call people out. There's some people, you might not want to come to our church because I might call you out. But I want you to know that I'm just as open. If you need to call me out, I've had some brothers correct me. I've had some brothers correct me and it's been the best thing in my life. Because listen, I want to be right. Like, don't you want to actually be right like with what you're doing? You don't want to live your life believing a lie, do you? Wouldn't you rather get your life together, get yourself together so you can go forward? Division isn't always a bad thing. Sometimes it'll point out some things we need to correct so we can move forward. The key is you got to do it with love. You have to do it with love and mercy in mind. Not to win arguments. Not to best somebody, but because you want the truth and you want what's best for people. That requires love. It requires mercy. 